Hello, Gail. Hello, how are you? Good. Is that the delightful little girl at the piano in your little, your Skype photo? You, I take it? Yes, it is. <laughs> Great. And nice to see you now. Yeah, good to meet you. Uh, so I'm here and I'm ready to speak to you. So, um, You have quite the eclectic background. You have classical and jazz and Burma and India in your yeah. background, <laughs> as well as yes. the UK. Um, yeah. Did you always fuse them into one, um, or, or um, did you go in only one direction at first? Look, for a brief moment, and now I'm talking about the age 12, I, that's where I sort of committed myself to music, I knew at age 12, but at that point I wanted to compose... And I didn't particularly want to play. I didn't particularly like performing. Uh, I didn't particularly like practicing, as a lot of kids don't. And I saw myself as a composer. And that naturally gravitated me towards the classical world, even though I you know, had a reasonable childlike understanding of jazz at that age. I didn't want to play. And composing would take you more to classical because the variety of ensembles you can compose for. It's much more exciting as a composer, I feel. The people that, there's only a couple of people I know in jazz who compose and don't play, and they generally write for big bands. And I like big band music, but I couldn't spend my life writing it. Whereas in classical, you can write choral music, orchestral music, string quartet music, solo piano music, solo classical guitar, solo, or there's no mixed chamber on, there's no limit to operas, there's no limit to the range. So... Initially, I was drawn to composing only, and then about 16, I decided, no, I do want to perform, and I started to take my playing a lot more seriously and did some serious classical piano studies, both here in Australia and in the United States. So by the time I was 16, I think I was pretty much going to do both. And I always have seen myself as, um, um, you know, doing both without sort of, I suppose my first love is composition. So I tend to approach jazz piano playing as a composer. You know, I'm very compositional in what I do there. Um, but I just never stopped doing one or the other. I just thought that uh, I'm both these people. And in fact, I also felt that they were more one thing than people Imagine, if you stand outside Western music and look back in onto Western music from a non-Western tradition, you would see classical and jazz as being much closer because they both use functional harmony as we understand it and instrumentation, even though there's differences. You know, there's a, they're closer than, than people would think. So I, um, I, I do find them very uh, uh, similar and... Of course, in my projects, I'll specialise. While I was writing the symphony, I wasn't even thinking about jazz playing for the, for the four or five, six months I was writing it. So, of course, in my work schedule, I'll sort of not disown, but I'll, I'll let one of my musical children do their own thing for a while while I have to deal with this, this thing and vice versa. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the collection and how it came to be? Yes, actually... Um, I've always loved writing solo piano music. I've written two books of piano preludes, which have 12 preludes each in them. That's a very traditional thing to do. And um, various other pieces. So I always had in my, my mind to write um, children's songs. And I knew that, you know, when I've mentioned that to people, they immediately think, oh, teaching pieces for children. But I knew that's not what I meant. And, of course, you know that too. I was inspired by the Schumann idea of an adult reflecting on childhood. So... I always had in the back of my mind that um, I would do something like that. I suppose it just needed a springboard. And what happened was the Adelaide Festival of the Arts in Australia asked me to do a solo piano recital. And they said, we love premieres. Can you premiere a new work? I said, well, I don't have anything to premiere, but I'll tell you what, I will write something for this concert. And I decided to write the, the collection for that concert. At the same time, I was talking very productively to Soundbrush Records in New York, and they were looking for a project for us to do. And I said, look, that might be, this might be the project. And they also uh, at the same time said, okay. I demoed them at home and recorded them up. And um, so the, the two things came together last year, which was the premiere recital. And then I think about six months later, I did the re recording for Soundbrush. So they were written just before Christmas 2011. So 
I guess well, I'm 18 months away from that now, but in that time I've composed them, uh, demoed them, performed them, and prepared them for recording and recorded them, and now it's released. So it's the circle has completed. With that narrative going through the works, that they would all be part of this collection called Children's Songs, how that manifested in the music, I think, was a number of things. The pieces would likely be short. You know, none of them are more than about two and a half, three minutes. Um, they would be the sort of they would be quite direct. They'd get to the point in whatever point they were trying to make. I suppose that's a characteristic of a child. So you know, if they were being wistful, they they were very directly wistful without beating around the bush. If they were playful, they'd be very directly playful. So concise and direct, very honest with emotions, not wrapping the emotions in too much intellectual artifice. And short pieces sort of are great for that. And also, I set myself the task of writing one a day. Uh, and with that kind of thing, it was quite easy to stick to. I've just written a symphony, and um, with that, it's not just like four separate pieces, each movement. They have to hang together really well and relate to each other. Whereas with a piano collection... The, the pieces can be very different, and it's a collection. You know, it's it's it, people can take two or three out of it. There is an overarching narrative in that children's songs idea, but I could ping pong back today. I want to write a minuet, you know. Um, so I had all those. I woke up in the morning with, hey, you know, let's do that. Let's, let's write a gavotte today, <laughs> you know. I'm thinking about those traditional forms and putting my own twist. So that journey was very interesting for me because I did achieve that. I did write one a day. I had one day off in the middle, so it took me 19 days to <laughs> write the, the 18 pieces. I had one day off after writing The River, which was a very, very complicated piece to conceive and to get down. Of all the pieces, that's probably the most complex and, and difficult to play, and it was hard to write. So I was a bit wrecked after writing that one, so I took the day off. Great. Um, so what are some of your most memorable musical moments, um, either humorous or um, inspiring? I always um, can't help coming back to the, my first time I played in Russia, which wasn't a, a jazz tour. I was invited to perform a piano concerto I'd written in St. Petersburg. And uh, I played with one of the orchestras in St. Petersburg, the St. Peter, St. Petersburg State Symphony Orchestra. And... Um, I suppose uh, there's this feeling of um, for someone to come coming from a young country, and we both come from relatively young countries compared to Russia, there's this feeling of uh, a massive weight of history and even recent history because what a very high musical moment for me was being in the dressing room and there's the piano there and I said, oh, great, I'll probably warm up on that piano. And the guy said, yes, Rachmaninoff used to do just that on that Why? piano. <laughs> That's sort of a high point for me, just the buzz I got from from feeling that. I often get uh, buzzes like that. Um, funnily enough, again, Rachmaninoff, because my um, piano teacher, Igor Melnitsky, who his father, Alexander Melnitsky, was quite a well-known pianist in Russia and they came to Australia and the son, Igor, taught me. And I was working on the B-flat minor sonata of Rachmaninoff, which is a Finnish piece. I actually gave myself RSI practicing it. And um, he said, oh, I've got a score that my father gave me and he sort of pulled out this score of the work and he said, see all those pencil markings? Rachmaninoff himself put those markings on the score and things like that I find real musical high points to sort of almost sort of you know that also that lineage thing with teachers where you know someone was taught by somebody who was taught by Liszt or those sort of those sort of things really excite me you know um I had the pleasure of speaking to Andre Previn on the phone a few times and um you know, knowing that he as a young boy improvised for Schoenberg, you know, that's in his one of his biographies. And, you know, things like that uh, I think I find very exciting. And I've had my little little tastes of that along the way. Something that seems so so remote, becoming quite immediate, almost like a family thing, well, thing as it was in the case of my piano teacher. What, did you encounter any difficulties studying seriously in the classical world um, when you played jazz too? I had 
Yes, I think I did, especially in in music school. I don't know how much it will, some of it might have been my own paranoia, and some of it might have been real. <laughs> Because I was a classical piano student, um, say a master student in classical piano, but at the same time I was making records as a jazz pianist professionally and releasing them. So I was a student in one and a professional in the other. Um, I don't know, sometimes I feel, you know, that, that maybe there was a scepticism about me, but I've also felt it in reverse. I felt that in the jazz world I'm I'm seen as a classical person and who gets into jazz and in the and and the vice versa so I think that it's <laughs> I do sort of get a little bit of bit of that and look I look at careers of artists who've who've dealt with that you know and I'm you know uh, very interested in Andre Previn for example who made a massive transition from Hollywood and jazz to classical but certainly it, it took him a while he talks about this you know he says that um the turning point for his acceptance in the classical world was getting a bad review on its own terms, not just Hollywood star Andre Previn, blah, 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 as the start of the review, but just not even mentioning them and saying bad review. But <laughs> you, so that, I, I find that quite interesting. So I look at someone like that working at that level and, and see how they've had to manage those sort of prejudices. They exist, but they shouldn't get in the way and they don't get in the way and you can also as an artist make too this is why I mentioned the word paranoia you can <laughs> be tempted to make too much of them and if you take a light hearted approach to it and just be yourself most people even if they are a bit suspect uh, hopefully might be seduced <laughs> I'm intrigued by the, the wind in the willow suite um, that came about by a wonderful organisation here called the Hush uh, Foundation, which raises money to help in children's hospitals in Australia. And the idea was to create, funny, again, the children's theme, but this one's specifically aimed at children, but again, I think accessible to adults. And various artists have been approached to make a recording that could be played in a hospital, perhaps when children were coming in for surgery to calm them or when they're in the wards to listen to. And... Um, I came up with the idea of Wind in the Willows because I've already always loved the story, but I also um, wanted to have narrations a la Peter and the Wolf, sort of alternations of music and um, and, and the um, music uh, producer of that project asked me to do a fully composed thing, not to have any improvisation or jazz involved. Many of the Hush CDs had had, had, had a jazz um, sort of based to them or improvised based to them. So I wrote this chamber music suite based on of the sort of piece of music then uh, we edited up the story into chunks and a bit more of the story and a bit more of music for a mixed chamber ensemble of about six of very fine, finest classical players in Australia really and I got to play with them which was wonderful with my own, playing my own music and it was, it was a lot of fun. So has there's been a lot of buzz here lately and over the internet with uh, Mitsuko Uchida's comments about whether or not you should be teaching um, people to present themselves in music school. Um, has social media and the internet changed the way that you um, manage your career? Well, I'm speaking to you now, <laughs> in, which is this is this wouldn't have happened ten years ago. I think so. I think it's actually enabled me to, and me and many others, to network much better, particularly if you're living a little bit isolated, as it were, in Australia, you're able to communicate. I don't know how I used to put tours together by fax, which my first tour of Russia, which I did with my trio in 1995, I didn't even have email then, and there's a pile of faxes about that high, and it, I can't imagine not how to organise things now without without the internet. So a couple of days stumbled across a blog entry I'd written which was talking about this business of self-promotion or just, you know, creating a platform for, for your music or making sure it goes forward. And the point was being made that a lot of artists are uncomfortable with that. But I suggested that it's sort of now part of their craft, if not part of their art. They need to know how to do this. Like, if an artist said, I'm really uncomfortable getting on stage, you'd say, well, if you want to be a performer, you're going to have to get over that. It seems to me that if you're uncomfortable networking, you're going to have to get over that if you want to have a career in music, unless you're 
particularly if you're working in niche music, where it's unlikely, and let's face it, classical music and jazz are now niche music, it's unlikely, unless you're at the very peak of international recognition in your profession, it's unlikely you can hire somebody to do that for you. Most artists are in a sort of cottage industry position until they a very few breakthrough to that level. So that they almost have no alternative but to do it themselves if they want to be on stage touring. Even as composers, I find you do need to sort of network, you know, and speak to a performer and say, you know, I'd love to write something for you. It really just comes down to communication after all. But the idea of the artist sort of in a bubble, insulated in a, in a garret with somebody sort of being their mouthpiece to the world would only happen for a very precious few people. I'm not not one of them. So I could see a strong case for it to be taught in music schools. Indeed, I've been invited to speak at music schools here on that particular issue, to do like a a one-and-a-half-hour workshop about networking or self-promotion or whatever. Self-promotion is not a really great term. I prefer networking, you know. (laughs) It's probably the best term you could use. Um, So, you know, I I wouldn't be... um, so repelled by the idea that these these issues are taught in music. I'm, I'm really thrilled that Children's Songs is out there, particularly that it's released internationally. Sometimes my releases are only Australia-wide and um, uh, it's been fantastic collaborating with Soundbrush and I, I really hope that it finds the people who it speaks to. Well, I think it will. They're really very lovely. And thanks for what you're doing with the Piano Addict blog i've had a look around it looks absolutely great and you know there's a lot of people who love the piano and yes. it's great that you're bringing them together well thank you all right well thank you too for for your interest in what i'm i'm doing it's greatly appreciated across so many miles uh it's really nice for me well best of luck to you thank you thank bye you. now gail bye